Two. Okay. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for January 4th, 2024. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with staff liaison may convene an, an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Ms. Lamanowski? Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Dr. Elmendorf? Present. Ms. Myers? And we also have Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. Kirk? Present. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we did all of that. Um, committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Com committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first and speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then stating their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call vote? Assistants will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay, so um, before we get started, just welcome back everybody to our first curriculum meeting of the new year. Um, also, thank you to staff for putting together all of the PowerPoints, the voiceovers for us um, to prepare for today's meeting. So. I found them really helpful. So um, when we go through them, you don't have to go through them slide by side. You can just make a you know, brief overall um, summary and then we'll get to questions and comments. Um, Dr. DiDonato, is there anything you'd like to start with? No, just welcome back and we're excited to uh, meet with you today to talk about some things that are really going to support our students moving forward. Okay. So first we're going to discuss and answer any questions about the BCPS Summer Program 2024. So Dr. Elmendorf and Ms. Kirk are here to answer any questions. I think um, Dr. Elmendorf, you're going to begin, correct? Correct, thank you. Um, next slide must go over, please. Thank you. So um, as you hopefully heard in the narrated version of this PowerPoint, we know that um, the ESSER funding is sunsetting. That is a significant portion of what we use to fund um, the summer programs in the last couple of years um, based on the intent of that funding to uh, close some gaps and uh, address learning needs as a result of the pandemic. So uh, this year we really wanted to, in light of that setting, sunsetting and as well as our new um, leadership in BCPS, we want to re reimagine and refocus our summer programming based on the fiscal realities and our system-wide priorities. So um, you'll see overall uh, closing gaps in elementary and middle school is our um, goal and credit recovery is our primary goal in high school. Um, next slide, please. So if you've been in BCPS for a while, you'll remember uh, that we had regional or cluster models in um, BCPS, we're, we're kind of going back to that in order to address the needs that we have currently in our school system. So um, students, um, the summer programs will be in specific schools and students may come from other schools to go to that school um, if needed. Uh, we're looking at four hours per day, five days per week, and the dates are July 8th to August 2nd, which is actually more on the... Um, Let's see, um, Scover, can you go to slide four, please? Okay. Um, yeah, so elementary, we will be focusing on um, our current and new um, curriculum for math and reading, so HMH and Bridges. 
And um, next slide, please, in middle school, which we're going to talk a lot more about in the next presentation, but we are proposing to use the Lavinia um, Summer Rise program, which is a research based model that is directly aligned with Maryland standards. And next slide, please, um, in high school, we are looking to focus on credit recovery for our students that we're especially trying to get across the stage in our summer um, graduation. I'll take any again. We're going to talk a lot more about the in the next presentation, but any other uh, questions we might have about summer programs in general for next summer or this coming summer? OK, thank you. Are there any questions from board members about the summer program? presentation? No, I just want to clarify um, the secondary curriculum that's being piloted. It's middle right. school and high school. Just, no, sorry, just middle school. So no, I know that I mean, like I know because several times in the PowerPoint it was mentioned that because we're getting ready to pilot something for secondary for ELA. Is that for OK? Yeah, let me explain that. that I can see how that could be confusing. Thank you for that question. So in elementary school we have and uh, Ms. Shea can maybe uh, lean in on this as well, but um, our, our content, our curriculum in elementary school is very current and um, we know that we are looking to pilot something or looking to have new curriculum in, in, in middle school. And so in light of that, we're looking to do something different while that transition is taking place um, and using Lavinia in, in just the middle school and not high school. We're in high school, it would be very much similar to what you've seen in the past with um, the FlexBlend model where students are um, accessing courses they need on their self-paced model in order to get through courses that they need to graduate. So um, if your question is about the actual core curriculum separate from summer, the curriculum that we're piloting for ELA is for 6 through 12. OK, yeah. Was, and high school. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was just high school, but through the yeah, presentation. 6 okay. through 12 courses, yep. OK, and then the other thing, when you talked about flex blend for high school, can you describe a little bit what you mean by flex blend? Sure, so FlexBlend is a term we're using now um, that replaced um, self-paced blended learning. Okay. Um, it's a more accurate term and it also um, reflects the um, evolution that we are moving through um, in order to make the, um, the platform with which students are interacting in the self-paced learning environments. So uh, Edmentum, Apex, you may have heard those, um, those companies, those platforms. Uh, to become more personalized and customized for students so that they're um, eventually the goal is to have content recovery so that students can come into the course wherever they need to come in and, and recover concepts that they may have missed or or didn't master as opposed to having to um, complete the, the entire course um, like they have done in the past. Okay, so it's really so just it's flexible, it's blended, it's flex blend. <laughs> uh, the, the research, it, one of the big reasons we changed the name is uh, the research really um, speaks to this idea of flex blend as opposed to self paced blended learning, which is what we were using in the past. Okay, and my last question is oh, it went through my head that fast. Hold it, wait a second. Um, oh, is the reason that we're going back to a cluster model because of the um, funding changing from ESSER? Is that why we're going back to the clusters? Primarily, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Primarily. So there was, with ESSER, there was the flexibility and funding to have those individual site-based programs. Um, schools you know, had a lot more autonomy with it, but I think what we also looked at is with um, not having as much systematic oversight of the summer programs with consistency among all of them. So, you know, middle schools in particular could, um, develop some of their own programs. There was a lot more autonomy for schools. And when we looked at the research, Dr. Elmendorf uh, provided a lot of research as we were going through this process on the, where you see the most benefit in summer programs. And when um, they are very systematic, strategic, there's a high level of accountability for attendance and participation. Um, the supportive of curriculum during the school year, which you see that's some of the decisions with regards to elementary. Um, making these kinds of shifts um, we believe are going to help enhance and help us really grow student learning during the summer. OK, thank you. Um, other board members questions? Um, this is Ms. Stolesky. I have a comment and question when Go it's ahead. appropriate. Yes. OK, thank you and thank you for the presentation. Um, 
In terms of the high school with um, credit recovery, is there any um, data that's collected about the reading levels of the students either coming into the program or then once they complete the summer school and get the requirements for graduation? Um, is there anything being done or a plan to do to ensure that um, students are graduating high school with a reasonable um, reading level? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. So primarily the focus of high school EYLP extended year learning program has been and the plan is to um, have schools identify the students who um, are in need of a small number of credits in order to graduate or students who would benefit from um, taking courses in the summer so that they can be on track for the fall. So I don't know that there is any specific system-wide um, effort to determine reading levels. It is more based on where students are as it relates to the number of credits they would need to graduate high school. And Ms. Okay, thank you. The, they offer a variety of courses. So at the elementary and middle school level, you thought it was really focused on just reading and math. It can be biology if that's the, the course that the student needs for high school. So it's really tailored at high school to a course that a student needs versus like larger concepts of reading and math that we're doing at the elementary and middle. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Um, you know, I just was thinking anything that we can do as part of this to just help, you know, boost reading levels as needed certainly um, it's always helpful, but thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Ms. Slusky. Any other questions from board members? Yeah, it's okay, Ms. Dominowski. Go ahead, Ms. Dominowski. Um, I just have, do we have any um, attendance records and, um, you know, for the summer school? I think we asked for this the last time it came around about, you know, who is invited to it and who's actually showing up. Um, I just want to see, you know, as far as you were know, offering those classes, I think um, I, and I don't know if this is still going on, but there was a teacher I was talking to and she taught dance and was teaching summer school. And I'm like, do we need to teach dance in summer school or do we need to focus on something else? I just I'm wondering about do we have, um, you know, who are we sending these out to? Who's who's coming? Are we getting are we really focusing on what really bang for the buck? Like, are we really focusing on, you know, those 70 percent kids who are not up to reading levels? Those are those are great questions, and I think of them as two questions. The first one is about attendance. We have very um, extensive data on um, the attendance rates for students who who registered and ha how often they attended. We actually, for the first time last summer, thanks to Ms. Kirk's efforts, um, actually had parents let us know why they weren't going to attend summer programs if they chose not to. Well, at least we 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 gave them that option to be able to. Um, share with us why they planned on not attending when we gave them that decision form. So we do we do have that attendance information for sure, and um, and by cor and course and by grade level, et cetera. And we can sh certainly share that. The second part, especially about dance, and maybe this is something I should have mentioned in the presentation. So um, programs like dance, and actually one of the reasons I moved here in 1998 was because of the summer music enrichment program. Um, that is not considered. Those are not considered part of the summer program presentation that you're hearing today. This is more the academic nature of summer programs. Those are, those are um, under Ms. Shea's department, and those are summer enrichment opportunities. Most of them arts oriented, like dance and music. Did you want to say anything else about those, Ms. Shea? Just that I'm glad they caused you to move here. Yeah. <laughs> But um, that they are, you know, and I just appreciate Ms. Dominowski. It is not, it is never the case that we choose to offer dance instead of offering um, summer school programs. They are separately funded, separate initiatives, right. um, and just both trying to serve a different need that we have at the same time. Thank you. Will we um, get a presentation on the results from that? Because I know, I mean, just for me, like, it's really hard to get my kid to go to summer programs because I mean, I just tried to sign up for summer camp and the registration opened on January 1st and it's already a waiting list. So it's, and I, I'm not, a, everyone's in that boat, but like I have to work, so I have to be able to figure that out and it costs a lot of money. And so that it's like, do I let them go to camp or do I let them, I don't know. <laughs> 
So I think part of um, your question is also tied to the next uh, presentation, which is the contract around the middle school um, summer program that we want to use. So as you know, depending on the outcomes of that and if we have to shift and make other decisions, um, we'll be part of our timeline. I've been communicating about summer programs um, with regards to and with summer programs, I do want to also say there's also our extended year services for our students receiving special education services, which that goes through like a different process with students being, um, you know, invited to participate through the IEP team process. So that timeline can, is much more fluid than sort of like the opening of our summer programs. Um, our goal for summer programs is we are truly using a data focused mechanism to identify students who will be participating in summer programs. So we're working with DRAA to look at variable various measurements for students. So we're looking at map scores. We're looking at um, grades in certain grade levels. We're looking at student attendance rates. Again, looking at ensuring that students are going to participate so they maximize their learning opportunities. Um, so we're using those data points to identify students who will be invited to summer programs. Any Thank other you. questions? Um, do we need a motion and voting on this? This is not a contract, correct? It's just a outline of the program. I believe so. I, I this think, next one is a contract, but not yeah, the, right, the next one is a contract. So we OK. All right, then I think um, this will be a good time to move on to the next one because it piggies back on the one we just talked about, which is um, summer learning programs specifically for middle school. So Dr. Elmendorf. OK, thank you. And if you could um, go to uh, slide three, please. Again, we are reimagining and refocusing, which is that second slide is the same second slide that you saw in the last PowerPoint. Um, so as we reimagine and kind of refocus for middle school, we're, we were looking to move away from what we um, have used in the past couple of years, which is a STEAM based curriculum um, and to something that's more directly related to the Maryland standards and gives us a really, really clear. Hopefully you'll hear it today. A really, real, really, really clear progress monitoring um, process and tools in order to make sure that the students are interacting with the materials in ways that are really helping them to progress toward very specific standards um, in reading and math. And so Lavinia is a print based curriculum, so teachers will access um, the print based materials uh, digitally, but it, this is something that students would be interacting with kind of sitting at their desks um, a lot like what they do during the school year. Um, but it's a print based curriculum with proven results across the country, including here in Montgomery um, County, Maryland and Baltimore City, uh, some of the Baltimore City charter schools as well. Um, it was approved by MSDE, but also went through our 6002 um, curriculum review process with 93% of the reviewers recommending uh, Lavinia for summer programs in middle school here in BCPS. If we could go to slide five, please. So part of um, Lavinia process here is that there are pre and post tests that are very much designed and calibrated based on proficiency levels in MCAP. And if you go to the next slide, um, this one, yeah, that's perfect. Um, you'll see these next two slides, one's math and one's reading, uh, kind of really lays out what the results are that we were really attracted to um, when looking into this curriculum. Um, these are results from the pretest, which is very much aligned with Maryland standards to the post tests that students took after summer. So this program is very much designed for a concentrated effort of teaching kids um, in the summer. Um, so it's a summer school curriculum as opposed to a curriculum that's being used during the school year and then modified to be pre-taught during the summer. Um, next slide, please. This is mathematics. Next slide. So this, um, and you'll, you'll hopefully heard in the narrative um, PowerPoint that this is uh, kind of lays out what the assessment and progress monitoring will, will look like. And this is one of the great features of this uh, curriculum is that it's very much um, helps us to understand on a daily basis where our kids are as it relates to the standards and certainly gives us um, as a system as a, and at the teacher level and at the school level um, a look at how our students are doing. Next slide. 
Uh, another really important feature of this curriculum is that it includes professional development. Uh, I was excited to hear how the professional development will be implemented. It's on an ongoing basis and it's part of the, you know, the cost of the contract. And um, it includes PD that really enhanced teacher capacity, not only during the summer with this curriculum, but also um, to help, help them beyond the summer into the school year, which is really important for us as a school system, I think, because we do have quite a few new teachers, um, some of which will certainly be um, some of our summer school teachers. Next slide. So that was a super brief overview. Um, the narrated PowerPoint was obviously more um, in detail. Hopefully you got a chance to listen to that, um, but certainly would love to take any questions that you might have at this time. Um, um, Ms. Pumphrey, questions? Yes, so um, this you mentioned this briefly that this is concentrated for the summer only because we are piloting one. My understanding is one new um, secondary ELA curriculum. So uh, um, my concern is this only for one summer? Or would this change after we adopt a new curriculum for ELA secondary ELA? The contract is for multiple years, so it could be used next summer and it could be used beyond middle school if we chose to do that. But okay, a decision my, hasn't been made for next summer yet. Two summers. Okay. Now. So I just my concern is putting the money into this for a brief period of time when we're piloting one specific, which if we're only piloting one, we're probably only going to probably going to adopt that new ELA curriculum for secondary can schools. I, can I offer one thing for context, just sure. because I think it might help. So the elementary ELA curriculum is unique in that it includes curriculum for summer school. Because the elementary curriculum has two additional modules by grade level that are a genre study, it's a perfect seamless opportunity for elementary curriculum. The current pilot for the secondary curriculum doesn't have the exact same thing. So even if we were to move forward with a new ELA curriculum, it does not mean that we wouldn't still use Lavinia for summer programs. So one doesn't necessarily negate the other. So I just want to offer that historically, it isn't that the current curriculum is always the secondary model for summer school. Sometimes it is a different approach because we mix kids up and we have different courses that come together. Um, the reason that Dr. Elmendorf cited it is that it's not currently that we would not build a summer program this summer off of a curriculum that we know we're replacing. So he was just connecting the dots to the timeline. But I just wanted to separate that just because we hopefully will move forward with procuring a new curriculum doesn't have a bearing on using a summer program curriculum. They're, they're two separate decisions that I think are getting combined. We're lucky that the elementary curriculum resource in HMH provides that seamless opportunity for elementary students, but that's actually very unique. We've never had that before. That's just an, a unique factor of the HMH into reading. So would you say it's more typical to have two separate um, curricula? I would. Or I would. I would say historically it's often um, either you write something that's specific because it's a, a different group of kids with a different teacher and usually specific to like priority areas, whereas a full curriculum is the entirety of the scope of a grade level. Historically, it's not unusual for us to have something that's either an extension or supplement or in some cases totally different. The HMH into reading is unique in that it has these two additional modules that are not a part of the scope and sequence that just provide what they call a genre. That's the first curriculum, I'll be honest with you, that I've ever encountered that has that, but certainly I invite Dr. Kraft to, to, um, to give her perspective, but I think that's actually the exception. Um, more than the rule is that they have this opportunity for extension. I agree. And the reason in elementary it's such a good fit is it's a review of all the standards, all the standards that have been taught that right. year. So they're not introducing any new standards. Everything's been taught. So it is very unique and it's a great approach, um, but I, a lot of curricula don't take that approach. So this is sort of a futuristic type of question. Do you think this summer you know, program fits would fit well if we adopted the new ELA curriculum that we're piloting. Yeah, so when the group was looking at Lavinia this summer for middle school, part of what they looked at was alignment to standards. And the the group, I think it was well over 93% of folks agreed, including staff from the ELA secondary office who's been privy to looking at the curriculum that we're piloting, agreed that this is a good fit from the standard perspective. Okay, and then um, just a comment as far as this actually came from 
um, some feedback from a stakeholder um, as far as these materials being available for review on the website. Um, uh, what I'm hearing is this particular program was difficult to find, whereas some of our some of our recently some of our programs have been listed easy to find directly on the home page of the site, and this was not. It was sort of buried underneath. Um, so if if we are if we are trying to be transparent, and I think policy actually dictates us to you know make this available for public review. Um, I think we need to be more proactive about making sure that this is easy for the public to find, and also letting them know that hey, we're going to be looking at this new curriculum, and we need. I mean, we want to let you know that it is available for review in the next several weeks or months, um, so that we can receive feedback from the public as well. Thank you. I think we've tried lots of different ways, and I think most recently we've been working with communications around using the splash page, that home page, which might be the one that they were referencing was better. So I think that that is ongoing feedback about improving the ability to be as transparent and direct for folks. So thank you for that. I don't even think that was directed to me, but I still was <laughs> unmuted, so I just answered. But no, thank, it's you. A comment. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, other questions about the middle school summer program? I just have Hi. one quick question, Mrs. Mistaleski. Go ahead, Ms. Stileski. Um, Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, just staying on the page of reading levels. Um, I'm on slide four, number two, um, sorry, number one, when it says um, beginning the year on grade level, is there anything specific regarding, um, you know, what reading level the students are on? or is it a more general data point for being on grade level? Thank you. Great question. So the Lavinia goal of maximize the number of students who begin the year on grade level, they're talking about um, implementing the summer, summer program so that students who are maybe aren't on grade level at the end of this school year would be on grade level at the beginning of next school year. But um, we are using a really, um, I hate using this word, but robust, if you will, formula that we worked with DRAA um, on to determine which students um, would benefit most from, from summer programs, including this program. And so we are still in the process of finalizing what that formula will look like, but we got inputs from, from various stakeholders, including um, folks from Ms. Shea's department on what would be the best uh, things to look at as far as um, characteristics of a learner that will really benefit from being in a summer program. So in other words, I guess my point is it's not based on a specific reading level that we would invite a student to summer programs. There are multiple factors that are considered when we are going when we determine who we would invite. OK, thank you. But it sounds like if a student would benefit from extra reading, it sounds like there's a good chance would they would be, be invited. You would be including them. And that's great right. to hear. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Great question. Ms. And I also Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Hi, this is Casey Kirk. Um, I also want to say that we are looking at our student invitations and tiers based on multiple data points, including their reading and math, map scores, grade level attendance. And I know that this was all mentioned before, but when we look at those map scores, we're looking at specific quartiles. And again, we are working with DRAA. So we're looking at multiple data points in order to determine which students would best fit the model for summer programs this year as well. Great, that's really great to hear. Thank you. Ms. Dominowski, question, comment? Yes, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment. It kind of it piggybacks <laughs> off what Ms. Pumphrey said. So I'm just kind of concerned that we're introducing a new program in summer school and having professional development for that when we're struggling with professional development for the regular school year. And we're introducing a new curriculum for ELA in um, secondary schools and I don't under I, I I get it's the norm that you have something different in the summer than you do in the regular school year, but I feel like we're giving our teachers too much to have to know how to do, and we're I mean can't we I just I don't understand why we're spending money on two different curriculums when and professional development when we're struggling to get enough professional development for the curriculums we have. So without. It's twofold. One is I don't want to preemptively say that we've identified a curriculum that we're going to purchase for next year. Truly, the, the purpose of doing a pilot is to evaluate the curriculum that um, we're looking at. And if it's not the right fit or if it's not yielding things that we want, then we need to do a pilot other curriculums next year. So I, I think that we're 
at an unfortunate timing crossroad with a very outdated old secondary ELA curriculum at the same time as trying to get a new one in place um, without preemptively saying that we've decided on something when we haven't and then also examining really revising what we're doing during summer programs to maximize the learning that occurs with students during summer programming. Um, I, when we're looking at an evidence-based program during the summer, when we're looking at being able to provide students with being able to measure students' learning outcomes during the summer, this program does provide us with the opportunity to do that. The other part about Lavinia is it's very standards-based focused, which is a instructional skill that teachers can carry across. When teachers understand standards, so like, what does it mean to be um, to understand informational text as a third grader and teachers really understand those standards? That depth of knowledge of standards is going to carry across any curriculum. And when the Common Core first rolled out, we did a lot of development with teachers on understanding the standards. So if it means the student should be able to infer, make inferences about reading a certain level of text or certain genre of text, what does that really mean? And so part of the PD related to Lavinia is related to that standards development for teachers. So we believe that this professional development is going to carry forward for us and not be a contradictory to, to anything else that we offer, but if anything beneficial. Yeah, just to elaborate on that, Dr. DiDonato, that's one of the things that was really attractive about this to us is that we know it's hard for many of our teachers to participate in professional development during the school year. This professional development is very much embedded into the school day. It is, they're being, you know, they're certainly paid for the time that they're um, spent interacting with these professionals. And it's very much like Dr. Dudano said, uh, designed to um, compel them to implement what they're learning in the summer in, in the school year as well. So it's not just um, real specific to just the summer. Thank you for that explanation. That, that that makes me feel better. Thanks. Um, with the professional development, with a four hour day, how do you do ongoing professional development for teachers in the summer? When would they have that? Um, I thought I had that on the slide. That's very, it's, it's structured so that they have it after the school days um, once a week, I believe. Is that right? Ms. Kirk, you have the um, hours there? Yes, so even though the instructional time is four hours a day for students, we build in an additional hour for planning and professional development for teachers every single day. Uh -huh. And as part of the Lavinia program, what they would do is meet synchronously with a Lavinia coach or professional developer, professional development facilitator for 45 minutes synchronously once a week and then 45 minutes there's an asynchronous piece and then it's yeah, not just right. professional development of learning the curriculum and that's where Dr. DiDonato and Dr. Elmendorf were saying that it should blend into the school year is that they're really looking at current student work and how can they make changes to their teaching the very next day during summer and that's something that they should be doing during the school year as well and I would also say that our student to teacher ratio will be smaller during the summer so teachers can really focus in on specific students and their work during that time period so it's the professional development is professional development and guided planning during the summer and that's how it's embedded into the summer program and the summer school contract for teachers has that stated that they are that that training is mandatory for two days a week versus during the school year we have to get teachers the 50 minutes and Yes, it's the five out. It's the additional hour that's built into the each day. There is professional development at the beginning of the program as well, you know, before it starts for, for one to two days, but then um, a total of six hours ongoing professional growth opportunities during the during the summer. But it's mandatory, correct, for teachers? Right. Okay. Any other questions about um, the summer school, middle school program? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the contract for the summer learning program for middle school? So moved, Dominowski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Stolesky. Thank you. Ms. Cox, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? 
Yes. Ms. Dolosky? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, the motion passes or the contract moves on to the contract committee. Next on the agenda is systematic instruction and phonological awareness, phonics and sight words, otherwise known as SIPs. So um, I think we have Ms. Shea and Dr. Kraft are ready for questions. So whoever is starting. Yeah, so we, um, good afternoon. Thanks for having us. Um, I will just really open it for questions. I know Dr. Kraft did the um, voiceover PowerPoint um, to talk specifically about how this um, supplemental intervention supports our students um, with needs in these particular foundational skills areas. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to the next slide. Um, in the interest of time, I don't think we need to go through the entirety. We can certainly open it to question, but just to remind that this is about um, tier two. Um, and what we want to do, we currently have a contract that supports this intervention in K-2, but we know that we need to continue to strengthen the supplemental intervention for students in grades three through five. Um, you can go to the next slide. And um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kraft. She can talk a little bit about the um, intent of the program is to accelerate progress, as we've talked many times with this committee and the full board about the larger literacy plan. We know that we want students' word recognition and decoding skills to become autom increasingly automatic and increasingly fluent so that their cognitive effort can be focused on comprehension. And part of this um, intervention is designed to supplement and accelerate progress so that students who leave second grade and have not yet become um, automatic or fluent have the opportunity to continue to receive that supplemental intervention. Dr. Kraft, I'll turn it over to you if there's anything specific you wanna add before we open it for questions. I'll just add one thing. Um, thank you, Ms. Shea, for that overview, um, that there are multiple levels. So the beginning level really addresses that simple alphabetic um, patterns and phrases. Um, the extension level addresses the spelling pattern phase, and the challenge level addresses the most complex polysyllabic morphemic phrases that uh, students need to learn. And so it's really uh, multifaceted in its approach. Um, this contract has already been approved by the board. Um, we are coming back because we need additional money specifically prefer for professional learning. So when we launched SIPs or relaunched it, um, it was actually right uh, when, during COVID. Um, and while we did prefer professional learning at the time, um, we realized that we've had a host of new teachers that have come in that have never had the opportunity to have that initial in-depth training. And our teachers that got the initial training, we'd like to deepen their knowledge um, of, of learning SIPs. And so that's really why we're coming back to you. And, and Ms. Shea and I are prepared to answer any questions that you might have at this point. Um. So one quick thing, but and then Ms. Pumphrey, I'll call on you. Um, on the contract that's going to the contract committee, it's called, um, what is this called? It's not called, it's called Intensive Reading Program. So nowhere on the contract piece does it use the word SIPs or the title. So um, first I was confused, but then I see that the heading on the PowerPoint has the number and the numbers match. But that's what that contract is, correct? Um, ASI 802-20. It is. Match up. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, up. They just don't use the. They just don't use the name of it. I just don't want there to be any confusion. Sometimes that's based on the way the RFI goes out that's, initially, that's and so that's actually directed from procurement. And okay. so what what we tend to do to help navigate that is either use the contract number or sometimes you'll see at the bottom of the exhibit that it was awarded to the specific vendor that identifies the product. OK, all right. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Yes, part of one of my questions, but oh, <laughs> my heart. No, that's good. My other question um, is, so the, the modification, is that for, you mentioned it's for professional development. Is that for K through five or only through three to five, three to five? No, it would be K through five would be provided um, learning. And really what I have started to do, as you know, we lost a lot of data um, with our registration system, but we have started to rebuild. Who, and in fact, I just finished who had that initial training. They will then be invited to the next level if they're still teaching it. And, and then anybody that is currently teaching it that didn't have that that initial training, they will be invited to the initial training. We can also provide some asynchronous professional learning 
learning options. So we recognize that there's not a one size fits all for professional learning anymore. And our goal is always 100%. And so gone are the days where we're like, oh, you didn't make it too bad. So sad, right? Like our approach is we are going to give this in multiple ways and multiple formats over multiple opportunities to ensure that everyone can be trained. OK, so are we already using this in three to five or are we only using it in K to two or for the past several years? Have we only been using it in K to two and now we're expanding to three to five? So the uh, the original expansion for three to five started right around COVID, um, and so it is not as robust as I would like to see, which partly is the professional learning piece. And so we do tell teachers they shouldn't be uh, using an intervention without the training. And so what this will do, so K2 was solidly in place before the pandemic. 3-5 is what we added on, and that honestly is really where we're seeing some of the gaps, right? So some of our students that were having foundational skill instruction during the pandemic, we are making sure that we're filling in those gaps. And so that those that is part of our target audience. OK, so do we have data that shows that this is working in K to two before we expand more into three to five? So such a great question. I'm really glad you asked that. So one of the things that we have been working really hard on and we now have a system in place um, and, and Dr. Di Donato has worked really hard making sure that we have every there's a lot of pieces that have to come to place to put this intervention data where it needs to go. So originally in Performance Matters, there was um, there was actually a section that was called intervention. Um, but they sunset that portion. And so instead, what we have done is we have created our own system to document um, growth over time. What I can tell you, we don't have fancy charts and graphs and everything because I don't have it living in a platform right now, is we have spreadsheets that schools submit to us at the end of the, I know this sounds so old school, but I'm just telling you the truth. So at the end of the year, they submit their spreadsheets, right, in a secure fashion, only through OneDrive. Um, and that is where we look and and we actually have individual conversations with schools if we see that there wasn't growth um but we also are seeing where it's really being used we are seeing major growth like they are exiting kids out of intervention for the next year and we want that for all of our students which means that we have to make sure that the professional learning is in place now next year when you ask me that question because i do want you to ask it again i'm going to have some beautiful graphs and charts and data um because we're now going to have it in a centralized system and I'm not going to have these individual spreadsheets that are coming in school by school. And I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. I just I do. I, I mean, I've mentioned in other meetings that I it's important to me that that, you know, that two to three transition and we definitely need those interventions yes. and see that students aren't making that mark. And I just want to make sure this is the right program to expand to that level. And of course, you know, we want to hear that we have data to show to show just support that it's working. Thank you, um, Ms. Domenowski. Yes, and this kind of goes back to something you said about um, you know you getting the data on who's already received the um, professional development, and then who the new teachers that need it. Can we see um, the data of the who was reached out to to receive the data? I mean, to receive the training and who actually completed it at some point. Does that make sense? We will, we will be able to do that now. So, oh, sorry, Jen. No, no, go right ahead. Michelle. So, I yeah, so one exactly of the what I say. <laughs> one of the upgrades that we've been working through in our registration system is to create playlists where we will now be. It used to be that we could put the training in the registration system and then teachers would register and we could tell you attendance. What we're going to be able to do now is to push it out specifically to the audience identified and then track of that audience what percentage completed mm -hmm. it by school so that then we can follow up and say you have five teachers at this school that teach this but only three have attended training so we've had significant upgrades made this year in how we can use the registration system to not only help us with data about who's required to have it and how do we monitor that but then also create playlists for teachers so now yeah. when i log on as a teacher it will say megan shea you're required yeah. to do this this and this based on your role so that's a significant improvement um takes a lot of work to fill in those groups and to create all those profiles and that's what we've been working on but um yes that is exactly where we're going great and yeah. and i just wanted that was perfect and michelle i'm just going to add on to that the, a nice feature is that i also can write principles and say 
I see that you're offering this intervention, but you don't have anybody trained at your trained school, right? So, so there, so we're really connecting the dots and trying to make sure that we, because we know what interventions they're offering in schools, because we are tracking that in focus. Then, if I see nobody's trained at the school, then I would say, okay, Miss Shay, guess what? I really need somebody who is offering this intervention at your school, and I need them trained. And so, we really are trying to make sure there's a concerted effort, and 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 the principal is a piece of that. And triangulating that with achievement data, right? So when we're talking about whether or not an intervention works, we also have to make sure that we've implemented it with fidelity, which includes that robust training and professional learning. So connecting all those is yeah. exciting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the contract ASI 802-20 for the um, systematic instruction and phonological awareness, phonics, and sight words. So moved, so Skleski. Dominowski. Okay, so we have so moved by Ms. Skleski and seconded by Ms. Dominowski. Um, Ms. Cox, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is an update of the ESOL strategic plan um, year two. So we have Ms. Shea and Ms. Hernandez for this piece. Good afternoon. Um, very excited to bring forward our update. As you know, we have been working through our ESOL strategic plan. Um, and when I talk about our ESOL strategic plan, what we are talking about is providing direct ESOL service to multilingual learners right in their neighborhood school. So historically, prior to this year, the model for elementary students was that students receiving services for ESOL received those services in their neighborhood school, but our secondary students attended one of nine centers. And so what we've been working towards is in a multi-year plan to be able to provide direct ESOL service to our multilingual learner population directly in their neighborhood school. And so what I wanted to provide today is an update. This slide really talks about our why. So I know you heard in the recording a lot of the information, um, but there are many data points around why we think this is the important priority of the school district, um, including providing access to um, students' opportunities to participate in after-school opportunities, whether they're academic supports or extracurricular, um, reducing transportation services, um, but also to make sure that our neighborhood Neighborhood schools reflect the communities and the diversity of the communities in which they sit. Um, so this I'm sure you can hear is something that we're really uh, committed to and proud of the work that we've been doing. Um, next slide. And so this year um, we actually started this plan. Um, I did want to reference, of course, you all are familiar with the Maryland Association for Boards of Education, um, but oftentimes we use the phrase looking through an equity lens. We use these guiding questions that MAPE has put out about what does it actually mean to look through an equity lens when you're making policy and program decisions? And so these questions have really guided a lot of the work that we've done as a committee. Um, who are the underrepresented groups? What are the different data points that are showing that um, they are currently being underserved? How are we intentionally involving stakeholders from that community in making some of these decisions? Um, next slide. Um, the other thing that I wanted to certainly um, highlight, of course, and, and again, we talk about this in many different contexts within um, BCPS, but of course, our multilingual learner population is our fastest growing population in Baltimore County, um, in Baltimore County proper, like in the entire community, but certainly in Baltimore County public schools. Um, and so that's another factor in why we think it's so important that we provide service, um, a model with a center, um, approach was really designed in an era when the number of students that we would serve in any one school was so small that it made sense at the time to pool our resources. Um, so rather than having um, one or two students sprinkled across different schools, at the time that the service model of a center was determined, um, we served a much smaller number of um, multilingual learners. Well, as you can see on this graph, the population of multilingual learners that we serve in Baltimore County Public Schools um, has far exceeded a number in which a center model is really sufficient. Um, we continue to enroll new multilingual learners in our school system every day. Um, and what we also wanted to capture on this is while we do see um, the population um, of enrollments, so 
as of December, we were at um, well over 12,000 multilingual learners. Um, having started the year in September, um, we've enrolled over 1,000. Um, you can see in the orange, we do also see that this is a population um, that is somewhat transient, um, but what you can also see in the comparison of the graphs of the blue representing entries to withdrawals, our, our enrollment is still um, far outpacing um, the withdrawals. And so because of those enrollment changes, it really became um, a priority. It's one of our superintendent's priority focus areas, um, and it's important that all of our schools are provided with the necessary resources and professional learning to serve these students right in their um, community school. So I was just pulling up to because even since I made this PowerPoint for all of you about a week ago, um, we are now at 12,430. So we have enrolled another 131 even since I made this slide. So just to illustrate that. Um, next slide. Um, this shows the difference in terms of um, years in ESOL. So you can see based on this donut that we do have a significant number of our multilingual learners that come in that have less than two years in ESOL. So we have a high percentage of students that have been with us since elementary school going into our secondary schools, but we're also seeing a significant increase in enrollment of our multilingual learners who come to us as newcomers in secondary grade levels, which obviously presents its own uh, unique set of challenges for older students. Next slide. And you can see here, this shows that enrollment across the grade level. So you can illustrate here that obviously the number of enrollees in the primary grades far exceeds those that are graduating. So the overall trend is continuing to increase um, with our enrollment at the grade levels. What you'll also notice is you see that dip in the middle school. Some of what we've also been observing over time, which was a reason why we knew it was so critical to shift our model of support, is that our students and families were waiving service in in order to stay in their neighborhood school. And so rather than leave their community school to go to one of the centers to receive service, they were foregoing service in order to stay in their community school. That's how important it was for them to be in their neighborhood school. And so some of that data illustrated to us that um, we had to shift our model of support. Next slide. Um, it's important too that we're always talking about a lot of times when we think about ESOL, we think just in terms of translating. But if you can see here, we serve students that speak over 100 different languages from 122 countries, um, which is exciting and talks about the incredible diversity that we're fortunate enough to have in our school system, but also, of course, presents um, instructional challenges. This isn't a matter of just translating resources. Um, of course, Spanish continues to be far and away our, our top language, and you can see here our top 10 languages. Um, oftentimes, Urdu and Arabic kind of um, are neck and neck, and at any given week might change in terms of what has the top two or top three spot, but that's a basic um, description of our top 10 languages with Spanish still clearly being our um, top spoken language. Next slide. And so just wanted to illustrate, as I mentioned, around ESOL at the secondary level, ESOL courses are taught just like any other course. So it has curriculum, it has, uh, it's taught by certified ESOL teachers in the same way that science or social studies. So it is not just a model of inclusion support, but actually its own course in which students are being taught English language development aligned to uh, the WIDA standards. And um, we have ESOL teachers and ESOL courses must be taught by certified ESOL teachers. Teachers. And there's also federal regulations that say students must be receiving that ESOL course instruction all year. Um, so this is not just a pull out situation. This is an actual um, instructional expectation with curriculum and standards and an assessment each year, uh, which we are just getting ready to embark on, which is the annual WIDA access assessment. Next slide. Um, and so you can see historically up through last school year, as I mentioned, we were serving our multilingual learners in a total of nine centers reflected there. This year, we expanded service to an additional 13 schools represented in the 23-24 um, block there. And then we have identified 12 more schools that will be welcoming their multilingual learners and serving them in their community schools, their neighborhood schools in the 24-25 school year. Um, the reason that we identify them so early is because these schools listed there for the 24-25 school year have now been embarking with us and will spend the rest of this school year engaged in professional learning and preparation to make sure that the teachers and the leaders and those communities are prepared to um, 
um, serve these students well. And I apologize, the slide gets cut off. That stemmer's run down at the bottom. Um, the way that we identified the schools in terms of the sequence was we used a combination of data points, including the number of L's that would be served in that community, the number of students that had been waiving, so students that were already at those buildings and not receiving any service, um, and then certainly also um, the time and country and some of those newcomer status. Um, our goal then is in the 25-26 school year, all the remaining schools would be in a position to provide that direct ESOL service right in the neighborhood which is exciting. Next slide. And so I mentioned and I know this committee and um, our board, we spent a lot of time talking about professional learning and this was a big commitment for us. And when we talked about meeting, uh, meeting both with our uh, teachers and leaders that were in the centers, our ESOL office, um, as well as different research models, we knew that professional learning was going to be key to making sure that our teachers and our leaders um, felt prepared. This is a um, national um, initiative in terms of there are many, many districts that um, talk about a challenge and uh, how much professional learning is required. It is not currently a part of the required certification for training to become a teacher. You know, there's certain courses that are required that teachers take in part of certification, and this is still an area that is not there. So we know that we have plenty of teachers that are going to need additional professional learning in order to be able to have those strategies in place for those linguistic supports. And so what you see on this screen is this is the plan. So those schools that were identified uh, engaged in this professional learning last year, and then the schools that we met with in November to say you've been identified to welcome home your multilingual learners for the 24-25 school year, this is the required training that they are beginning to engage in. Um, and later this evening, we'll talk about a contract to help us expand that first training, the most important, uh, which is that sheltered instruction observation protocol. That is a very intense training. It is three full days. Um, our goal is to have every teacher um, participate in that full training. It provides linguistic supports and instructional strategies for helping students um, access content um, while developing their English language development. And then we also have additional trainings around our elevation platform, which is a platform we use both for analyzing data and also um, professional learning. Um, and then we have um, required training for other staff that support families, whether it's front office secretaries, the nurse, guidance, and specifically master schedulers about some of those best practices for supporting multilingual learners and their families. Um, so wanted to update you, you can go to the next slide, um, the schools that we've identified as well as the professional learning. Um, and speaking of professional learning, one of the other areas of professional learning, um, as you know, we have an opportunity to meet monthly with our principals through principal leadership development. And so each month, our principals, one of the sessions that they get to attend is around supporting multilingual learners um, and actually applying the components of that PSYOP training to different contents. So what you see listed here are eight of the PSYOP components. And then what we do each month, we meet with principals, we showcase or highlight some of those PSYOP strategies through a specific content area. And the goal there is to take that training and apply it um, from a leadership and instructional leadership lens. Next slide. And as I mentioned, we're just about to kick off our WIDA Access annual um, testing. This is English language proficiency testing required um, by ESSA for all English learners in grades K through 12. Um, it measures English proficiency across four domains of language. Students are considered proficient. The levels range from one to six, and students are con considered proficient and can exit ESOL services once they've achieved 4.5 or higher. Um, and there's also annual growth targets. So our progress is measured both by the percentage of students that meet that annual target as well as um, earning that exit. Um, and when we talk about star ratings and MD report card, um, English language proficiency is 10 points, which is a, a big portion of the way that we are evaluating our commitment to serving this population. Next slide. 
We're also really excited about continuing to expand our opportunities. So as our population of English learners grows, while it has academic impacts, it also has impacts just on our larger community and how we support students and their families. And we know that communication is such a key part of the way that we create those strong partnerships between schools and families. Um, Talking Points is a really exciting application. It allows for two-way messaging using a text messaging approach, but it uses um, sheltered numbers. Numbers, so it doesn't actually use your phone number, but allows for two way communication from English to a native language. So I can as a teacher or as a school based administrator or even a counselor, I can send a text message in English and a student's family would receive it in perhaps Urdu or Arabic. They can then text back in Urdu or Arabic and I would receive it in English. So it provides that ability to have supplemental two way communication and I say supplemental because of course we still still have our system wide messaging applications, but this provides an opportunity for that supplemental communication, um, not only using that two way communication and the different translations, but it also includes an educational glossary and human translator support. So some things don't translate word by word. There's cultural context to the way that um, we engage in schooling in America and through the English language, and so it provides that opportunity to support students and their families in that way. Next slide. So we have been meeting, as I mentioned, um, in October. We went and met with every school that was receiving their students this year to sort of check in on how all the professional learning we had done last year, the school year started. We went and met with every school leadership team to talk about how it was going, what else they need. Then in November, we met with every school identified for next year to meet with their instructional leadership team, identify this plan of professional learning um, and plan of support. We meet regularly between the Division of Curriculum and Instruction and the Department of School we also have regular office hours with master schedulers and school counselors um, and then our content offices have also been charged with providing ongoing threads of professional learning within the content whether it's math or science or social studies specifically to serving a population of multilingual learners um, next slide and then um, for external communication, students who are currently in middle school and high school and have chosen to receive their ESOL service at one of the centers. So if I'm currently attending, um, say for example, Subbrook, but I'm slated for Catonsville Middle, I'm actually given the choice. I've already started at Subbrook Middle. I'm in seventh grade and perhaps I'm doing very well. Um, Catonsville is my neighborhood school, but I'm gonna actually stay at Subbrook next year. So kids who are currently enrolled in those centers and receiving services have the option to remain at that center to continue to receive the service or to go home to their neighborhood school. Incoming sixth and ninth graders would automatically be enrolled in their neighborhood school to receive service. And so those letters went out in December. Um, they were translated into um, any number of languages depending on the different community and then we are continuing to utilize additional methods of communication including but not limited to phone calls this um, text messaging app I mentioned the talking points and then even utilizing supports like our counselors and our PPWs uh, to support families so that our families and our welcome center staff also supports families with understanding these choices so that they can make the decision that's best for their student for next year next slide and so just to, to end it on a, a happy note, and some of this is animating, we've been asking, it is a big lift, right? Because you're talking about helping teachers across content serve a population of students that they haven't previously had specific training on, they want to do well. Um, and despite the fact that it is a huge lift and a lot of work, it's also been incredibly rewarding. And so we had asked some of our, as we met with schools this year and went back to them to say, so what's been the best part so far? Um, some of our students and our teachers and our leaders have shared some really incredible highlights about um, how wonderful it is um, to be able to be in their neighborhood, part of their community, and still receive that direct service. So with that, I'm going to open it to questions that you have for me and for Ms. Hernandez. So thank you for that. And Ms. Domanowski, you want to start us off? Yes, thank you for all that. Um, this is great. I know um, this is a very large, fast growing population. Um, what was it like? 12,400 now already. Um, yes. I'm just wondering, we're essentially see, um, teaching a second language and English is by far the hardest language to learn. I'm still learning it myself. But how do we incorporate this and teach second languages like 
and since Spanish is by far the, the, the strongest, the most spoken word, like how do we, you know, now teach that Spanish to our English, like strengthen the Spanish um, curriculum or the make it, it, it seems like this could be used with students that are trying to learn to another language as well. Like put the, you know, the English speaking students that want to learn Spanish with the Spanish speaking that are trying to learn English. You know, like how do we, yeah. how so do we make everybody bilingual? Basically. Yeah, Ms. Domenasti, you're actually, um, Blueprint talks about exactly what you're talking about in terms of dual language immersion. So that's what you're talking about. So how do we actually, because when we're talking about global, com globally competitive graduates, you do need to be bilingual or even trilingual to be competitive. Um, and so Blueprint does talk about moving forward. That's a future goal. So Blueprint's really like a five to 10 year plan. Really, it talks about where we want to be in like 2030 to 2031 um, for dual language immersion. What we are doing right now though is some of the same approaches around linguistic development are true. So we know that we have um, students who have the opportunity to engage in learning that second language. We also know that we have students who while Spanish may be the language that they speak at home, they may not be literate in Spanish. They might just have learned that kind of in their home, but they've never been actually taught to read or write. And so we have also developed a course in um, for Spanish for native and heritage speakers because the research says that as you develop your L1, you strengthen your ability to learn a second language, whether your L1 is English. So all the work we're doing around literacy in English helps kids to acquire a second language. And then also helping our Spanish speaking students to develop their literacy in Spanish because even though that's the home language they're spoken, they may never have received instruction in that. Um, and then what you're talking about is it is part of our goal moving forward. And actually um, in Blueprint, they talk about identifying schools where you have um, over 50% of your students, where you are able to start hiring bilingual educators so that you can have different models of dual language instruction. Um, so that is definitely a vision for us as a system of where we um, want to go in the future. Of course, it comes with probably the biggest challenge is what I just referenced about bilingual educators. And so working specifically around um, because it isn't just a matter of teaching calculus in Spanish. If the students who are in that class have never been taught to read and write in Spanish themselves, they may know it colloquially and in their house. Um, so you want to make sure that they're literate in Spanish and that you have an educator that is truly bilingual um, to be able to teach those high levels. So it is definitely the future. It's a part of what Blueprint calls us to be thinking about. Um, there are other districts across the state that have smaller models that they have started. PG County has an even bigger population. Um, so that's something that we are um, also working towards. I, Dr. Dina, I don't know if you were about to say something, um, but I want to. That's OK. I think you shared it all. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? So my only one little question is, I know you talked about the optimist, the, um, what did you call it? An optimistic end closure. There it is. Yeah. Um, were there any like ahas that you also learned by meeting with the principals currently doing it or the staff that's helping oh, you? Oh, yes. So yes, what would be like right. the top two or three? Well, answers? actually, it's a perfect segue because one of the biggest ahas that we learned from schools last year when we were trying to do the professional learning, we gave schools a lot of options because we thought it would be best to let schools decide sort of how they wanted to engage in SIOP. And one of our biggest ahas was that we needed to create more structured approaches, which is going to lead into my request around the contract for SIOP because schools said to us, we didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't, you know, you were trying to give us the autonomy as leaders to make decisions, but this is a whole new world. And so a lot of the feedback we got from our year one principals was you need to be more directive. You need to cohort our staff. You need to create that um, structure so that the professional learning is non-negotiable because when there were too many options last year we tried to do oh we had a menu and you could do it blended or you could do it in the summer or you could do and it it didn't work as well because um, so that was probably our number one was around professional learning and creating much more structures and cohorting staff to do that in teams um, was the number one thing we got we also got a lot of feedback around um, 
scheduling. Yep. So um, a lot of the information about master schedulers, which is why one of the changes we made last year, we did, I think, like a training in November and then one again in the spring. Now we're doing it monthly where we have a specific cohort of um, the supervisor of master scheduling, Deanna Gianelli, meets with the schedulers of these schools looking at specific models for scheduling for multilingual learners. Um, because they're not a monolith, so kids can come in and have interrupted formal education. We have refugee students who haven't been in schools in six years. We have students who come in who are completely fluent in their native language and are ready for AP courses and everything in between. And the scheduling for that, especially in secondary grade levels, has real consequence in terms of graduation and kids being on track. And so another big aha that we got when we went back to schools this year to meet with them, um, was around that. And then the third big aha that schools have shared with us, because you don't know until you're in it, um, we often see spikes in enrollment in September, and then we see we see enrollment trends constantly happening, but we see big spikes in September and then right around now, because this time of year coincides with the end of the school year in some other countries, right? Not every country uses the same agrarian schedule we use. Um, and so helping schools maintain flexibility to be prepared when that enrollment shifts happen. Some of these schools are schools that historically did not have transient populations and were not used to having ongoing enrollment. And so one of their big ahas was how do they create structures? One of the principals said to me, he did this amazing back to school activity with families and was really community oriented and welcomed them all in August. And then the following two weeks enrolled 38 children. <laughs> and so he was like, I've learned that I should wait and do that probably in the third week of September because it's pretty typical. Um, so those are some of the ahas that we've learned centrally and some of the adjustments we're making around um, how we support. And then coming up later this month, we actually have paired our year two schools with a year one principal so that they have a thought partner. They have a friend who's about six months ahead of them. We didn't have that really for our year one schools because the principals that had experience were in a center model, which was very different. They had many more students and much more staffing. Um, but having that thought partner as leaders and for department chairs and schedulers to have some a phone a friend that is about six months ahead of them and can say, my school's kind of like yours, here's what we've learned, um, is really powerful. And we actually have that engagement coming up uh, this month for them to, to partner that way. Thanks for sharing that. That last part's huge, that, that coaching. Um, and Ms. Hernandez is writing, we've been utilizing the Welcome Center bus to enhance community outreach programming and student assessment. Um, thank you for that, Ms. Hernandez. Yeah, her audio is not working. So she's okay. back now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, though. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we we got a lot of great feedback that there were a lot of community events that were very well attended by our multilingual learners and their families, and it just was really heartwarming um, for a lot of the schools and their teachers. So we've been using the bus to kind of enhance that opportunity and continue to provide additional services and parent programming as as possible using the bus. So I just wanted to add that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, again, this is not a contract, just an update, so we don't need to vote on it, but it'll slide right into our last agenda item, which is the SIOP Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol. So you touched on it, but um, we'll move to yes. that one. So this is the training that we referenced um, and this contract modification allows for what we've done in response and, and you were a perfect um, segue. So SIOP is a research based instructional approach and it specifically integrates language with content. So the audience for SIOP is actually not really ESOL teachers, it's everybody else. It's our science, social studies, ELA, math teachers about how do they create content in a way that's accessible for students as they're acquiring English. Um, and because this is an area of priority for our district, we know, and this is a huge lift. So we're um, preparing to train. Uh, we right now have over 400 teachers that are registered to engage in this training right now, starting um, this month. The increase that we're requesting um, allows us to go at a much faster pace. So we are planning with, once we get, if we get the uh, spending authority increase, our plan is to have 28 cohorts of teachers engaged this semester. In the past, we've done 
maybe two to five cohorts a year where we've done sort of a group of teachers from each building. Some of what the um, schools that were our centers and some of our other, some of the research, the evidence-based research says that SIOP works best when it's a whole school approach, when every teacher in the building has had that opportunity to understand how to integrate language and content. Um, and so the request is to allow us to increase the pace and increase the, um, accelerate the opportunities for um, entire teams of teachers through cohorts to engage in that professional learning. Um, and then it will be ongoing. We'll continue to offer SIOP training um, for teachers. And we even have teachers reaching out that are not um, in schools on that list, but already know that their population is growing as well. Um, we have new teachers that have um, that are now working at some of the centers um, who need that training. So we know with that population continuing to grow, um, that this is going to continue to be a priority. Um, and then just in terms of funding source, this is where Title III grant funding is um, a big portion of our Title III grant fund um, is allocated for professional learning because that's a priority from both the federal government, but also um, blueprint is to make sure that we are serving these students well. Um, thank you for that. Um, a silly question, but it, it, why is this called sheltered instruction? I've always wondered why <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to me. Where, where, where is that coming from? You know, I don't know the origin of the name, but Ms. Hernandez might. I think it used to come from years ago. We used to have sheltered instruction for ESOL students, and um, that's really where it originated. And so that's why most people just use the term PSYOP, because we are no longer right. specifically sheltered. Right. That is right. an awesome question. Sheltered. Thank you for asking it. Yeah. Well, because it just sheltered goes down. It's counterintuitive, like, but then Ms. Shea started by saying the audience is other than right Yes teachers. So but, that, but even when it was sheltered, it would still be a math teacher. It just used to be that they would put a high preponderance of multilingual learners in one algebra teacher's class. But what we know from research is kids need models of native English speakers together. And to Ms. Dominowski's point, it also helps to improve um, that, that opportunity for all students. But um, I think the name of the strategy was also the evidence base. So I think they probably don't want to change it because there is a, a significant body of research about the approach. But that is why we tend to use the acronym PSYOP <laughs> um, because we don't recommend sheltered classes unless there's, like I said, a dual language opportunity and then it might be appropriate. But in general, we don't. Thank you. Other board members questions? OK, here is one quick. I'm oh, sorry, I was trying to remember what my question was. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, do have we uh, for the title three grants? Are we already, you know, in the process of applications? You know, everything's ready to go. Oh, yes, the every year this has already been submitted. So and yeah. this was written in for, you know, the FY22, FY23 and FY24, which was submitted to MSD already. So this is already identified in the grant as the funding source for it. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the contract for the for SIOP? Humphrey. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Is there a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Ms. Cox, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Dolowski? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any other further business from anyone at this point? OK, our next curriculum committee meeting will be held on February 1st, um, which is just about <laughs> three to four weeks from now. Um, I want to again thank staff for the presentations that you had online for us. It really does continue to help us to prepare for the meeting and kind of um, focus our questions. So thank you for that work, especially coming right off of um, winter break. So at this point, we are now adjourned at 552. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Goodbye, everybody.